1918, which was Armistice Day, so he did not have to go into combat. Uh, my uncle was a, uh, in the uh, Ar U.S. Army in the infantry. Uh, he was in the, the unit that uh, met with the Russians when they first became our allies. He used to joke with me that he was the guy in the picture jumping across the river shaking hands with the Russians. Uh, but I know he wasn't. Uh, my father was a veterinarian and he rose to the rank of uh, lieutenant colonel in the uh, Army Reserve in the Veterinary Corps. Uh, as I said, he was a veterinarian uh, early in, uh, in my life. My brother and I used to attend, go down to his hospital a lot to, to help him out or just to be interested and, and see what he did down there. Also, a lot of times we, uh, we were grounded and we'd have to go down there and clean out the kennels and the cages. Um, but we'd also uh, watch him do operations and help him clean up. You're going to have to throw your voice a little bit more. because. Oh, you guys can't hear me back there? Okay. There all right, I'll get a little closer here. I'll eat that mic, as they say. Uh, so where were we here? Uh, oh yeah, and, and I'd, so I'd watch the surgeries and help them clean up and things like that. So I was, I was used to, to seeing blood and tissue and everything. Uh, he we even uh, took some uh, puppies in our kitchen and he would cut their tails off uh, on the breadboard and I'd put them in an envelope and I'd take them to school for show and tell. Uh, <laughs> If you'd have told me then I was going to be a combat medic in Vietnam, I would have told you I was crazy. Um, I, when I graduated from uh, Pasadena High School, uh, I, went, I got accepted at Washington State University, and so I went up to Pullman, Washington, where most of my family had also uh, gone to school. Um, after, my first, after my freshman year, I got uh, my draft notice. I went to the selected service board and the draft board trying to appeal my deferment, but I was not, uh, denied a preferment, so uh, deferment, so I was uh, inducted into the Army. Went to, uh, I went to uh, Fort Ord, uh, California for my basic training. I was uh, very athletic in school, I uh, gymnast in baseball, uh, lightweight football at college. And so I passed all the PT tests that they, they threw at us at uh, basic training. I uh, passed the OCS test. They wanted me to be OS, OCS material. I declined that. I did not want to be an officer. I did not want to necessarily lead men. Uh, I didn't even want to carry a weapon, actually. Uh, so I was very interested in the medical uh, field. Um, I was uh, recruited highly by the Special Forces Training Group. And I really, enjoyed, I really loved their presentation, and so I decided that I wanted to join the Special Forces Training Group. Reasons being, they had much more medical training than the Army medics. I didn't necessarily want to be behind a, a desk or in intel. I wanted to be out in the field, and I had to sign up for an extra year. I had to become a RA, RA 1980665. Uh, in order to become special forces uh, so that was uh, and the main reason was that you had to go to jump school become a paratrooper and I was making $86 a month and that was $55 a month extra plus the extra year so that was uh, a good income for me um, so anyway I decided to join into the special forces group they had five uh, specialties operations and intelligence engineering communications weapons and medical uh, so that's what I, 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 I choose to choose to do chose to do um, went to Fort Sam Houston for my AIT that was the the basic AIT training for that the army had it was a six-week program um, that's where I was introduced to the uh, conscientious objectors. There was a company of conscientious objector, objectors at uh, Fort Sam Houston and they asked me if I wanted to join that company. I said no, I didn't want to be a non-service uh, CEO. I wanted to be like Sergeant York. Um, so I don't, he was a World War I uh, conscientious objector. I don't know if anyone has remembered Sergeant York. Um, but that was that was kind of my idea that I, that I wanted to uh, to do that. At, 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 so at Fort Sam Houston was where the basic AIT training was. Then after that, went to jump school. Jump school was at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. 
This is where all the uh, all the military uh, did their paratro their jumps. The, the Marines and the Navy, the Air Force, the Army. Uh, that that was all at Fort Benning, Georgia. We first learned uh, classrooms. We had we learned the ins and outs of jumping. We we worked with the riggers, uh, and then we finally learned how to pack our own chutes. Uh, whoops. I gotta go backwards here, excuse me. Okay, we, uh, we, we first started out uh, with uh, learning PLFs, platform landing falls. When we were about six feet, uh, we were suspended or we were on a platform and we would jump off that learning how to land. It was very important how to land. Uh, uh, doing a platform landing fall, you'd land on your ankle, your knee, and your hips, and your shoulder, and you would roll instead of just boom, landing on down. Um, that became a, a key to the future jumps that we, that we were going to do. Um, there's a gentleman landing like, like that, that's probably the wrong landing. Uh, and then, the, so then we went to the 30 foot, 32 foot towers. Uh, you, we would we would climb up 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 the ladders, stand in the door, and then hook up to a, a zip line, and then go go on down. It's kind of weird. The first jump was weird because you're just looking down there, 32 feet, and you're jumping in there. But after you do it uh, the first time, then it's kind of simple, and we we would do that all day long. Uh, next, we would go to the 250 foot tower where they would let us down uh, from uh, from a open open uh, open chutes up there, and they would just drop us down. And then again, you would have to do the platform landing fall. If somebody, if some sergeant or officer saw you not doing it correctly, they would drop you for push-ups. Uh, then the last week was jump week. Here, we, here we have all our. Uh, all our equipment on, shoot, emergency shoot, and our pa uh, steel pod and all our equipment. It's, it's all about 40 or 50 pounds of equipment that you have on. Uh, then we did the, the jump week. It was five, five jumps, uh, a tree jump, an electrical wire jump, a water jump, and some open field jumps. We did one jump out of a Huey. We did a jump out of a uh, uh, C-130, is that what that is? Uh, C-130s out of the rear, and then we even had a jump out of a jet. When we did the jump out of a jet, I was, I was about six feet from the door. I became vertical, and I just shot out of that jet like a cannon. I was second or third man out on the stick, and I was the last one to land, because I, I went flying up. Uh, then we get your jump wings. And then, uh, uh, then I was off to uh, Sam Houston to start the Special Forces Medical Training. At Fort, Ch uh, Fort Sam Houston with the medical training, uh, that was when we had classroom, classroom work. We worked with the University of Texas uh, professors and doctors as well as Army doctors. Uh, we went over anatomy, physiology, histology, pathology, uh, emphasis on parasitology because of Vietnam, and we had great uh, great instructors and great training in that sense. Uh, then we were off to Fort Bragg for the combat uh, and special forces medical training. Uh, first at Fort, Fort Bragg, uh, we did a survival, 10 days of survival out in the swamps of North Carolina. And then we were cross-trained, thank you. <laughs> then we were cross-trained in, uh, in all the five areas of, of special forces. Uh, operations and intelligence. We went to uh, Fort Devon in Ayer, Massachusetts. Uh, and then we were cross-trained in communications, engineering, and weapons, where we learned to assemble, uh, to take apart and assemble every and fire every weapon that special, special forces had. I became an expert in almost all the weaponry. Uh, so the special forces said it was a shame that I was going to be a conscientious objector. Uh, whoops, whoop, not yet. Okay, then we, did, then we went through an intensive uh, training at, at Fort Bragg. 
Uh, we dissected pigs. Uh, we had uh, live goats that we would anesthetize and we would do tracheotomies because they had a long trachea. So we would do cricoid thyroidectomies. Uh, each ring around the uh, your trachea there is called a cricoid. So you can do a, a thyroidectomy in any one of those, uh, which later became very useful to me actually. Um, and then we had what was called dog lab where we would, uh, each of us had a patient that was a dog. We would anesthetize the dog, put them in a chamber, and then fire a M16 round into their thigh. After that, we would extract the bullet, debride the wound, suture it up, and then uh, rehab the dog for, uh, after that to make sure that it, uh, everything went all right. So we had a pretty intensive uh, medical training uh, at Special Forces. We even went to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where I worked with uh, orthopedics and infectious wards, where we worked, uh, where we learned how to, to splint and cast and get someone back to the ambulatory state. And we did, worked with a lot of infectious diseases that we might run into in Vietnam. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, I got to look at my notes here real quick. Uh, yeah, and then, so and then after that, uh, we uh, went into the hospitals and, and worked with patients. And what we became was actually uh, what is now a physician's assistant. So we, we were trained and did everything up until, except for internship and residency. Uh, then on September 1st, I got my orders for Vietnam. October 1st, landed in, landed in Long Bin. I uh, went to jungle school in my orientation, and then I was assigned to the 173rd Airborne Unit. Uh, the reason we didn't go into a Special Forces Unit was because they were, at that time, they were uh, downsizing and, and getting uh, withdrawing the Special Forces Units and not replacing them. Uh, there's, there's like a, a uniform, you can see the... Uh, well, you know all the insignia and everything, except all of this would, there's the wings and the, all this would be in black when we were in Vietnam. There was no, no color in your uniform or no red cross or anything like that. Um, on, a, on a patrol, when I first got into Nam, um, basically what we were doing was uh, recon and, and uh, patrols uh, on this patrol, whoops. This patrol here, uh, I was usually uh, near the medic. Not, I, mean, I was the medic. I was usually near the RTO guy. Uh, so this would be me here or here, and the lieutenant was also there, uh, usually at the end of the end of the platoon, end of the stick, end of the platoons. Uh, this particular platoon, I, I don't appreciate it because the guys are way too close together. Uh, this is uh, one of the first guys I met, my RTO. I shared a hooch with him, uh, Bill Marucci, Mooch. And he became one of my be uh, best friends during the, during the uh, first uh, year I was there. And then here was a uh, uh, Kit Carson scout. Uh, these, these were Kit Carson scouts who, who chew-hoyed. They surrendered and became over on our side and they would help us uh, uh, to what we would do is look for caches of weapons and rice and ammo, anything that would uh, cut the uh, the chain of supply to the North Vietnamese. Uh, the, at this time in the war, uh, the Vietnam. Here's one of the patrols here. At this time in the war, the Vietnamese uh, were totally uh, demolished and 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 losing and frightened and uh, the Ar U.S. Army was taking over uh, all the sanctuaries in South Vietnam that they could find. What they would do then is they tried to uh, attack or ambush us um, and then they would run. They'd take their best shot and then they'd run. Um, and we would just try to uh, uh, patrol and survive with them. In the, in the, in the valley where I was in, there was jungles and and rice patties. Uh, our point man, Big O, was our point man, and uh, we had a. Oops, we had a. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. Big O was our point man, and he was the one that would uh, discover any kind of uh, booby traps that we'd run into. Um, I, I myself, I carried a uh, the gear, the medical bag that I uh, that I carried, uh, two medical bags. Uh, you can see this. Uh, here's a medic that has some of the. 
inside the bags here, uh, I had uh, IV solutions, surgical equipment, uh, morphine, we had water tablets, pressure uh, dressings of different sizes. That was the most important uh, thing that I could use. Uh, I had more supplies than a regular combat medic just because of my, of my training. Um, the, uh, our water all had to be treated. That was the medic's uh, option to keep the water. I usually carried two to four canteens uh, with me, so I, so I had enough water for everyone, as well as the, uh, uh, the water tablets that we, that we had. Uh, then, let's see. Okay, uh, there's the equipment. Got to get this here. Uh, our supplies were dropped to us by air, never by ground. Uh, we had every 10 days we would get our fatigues, we would get our C rations or any kind of medical supplies or anything we would, we would need. Usually it was Huey's, uh, Huey, Huey choppers would usually send it in. Every once in a while it would be a, an airdrop like this or, or a Chinook, a, a shit hook. So we'd all have to hold everything down when they, when they came in, they would blow everything all over the place. Uh, dust offs, the 173rd had our gunny chips and dust offs. This was the most important thing uh, that, that I went through in my life was being grateful to our helicopters and helicopters pilots. Um, the dust offs, uh, they would come in uh, and, and take any patient that I had. The very first uh, time I was dropped into our platoon, I think it was the first week I was in country. Uh, our platoon, our company was going into the Anlo Valley and the platoons were setting up their, uh, their, their bases. Um, when I got in in the morning, that afternoon we got hit by uh, uh, mortars, AK-47s and sniper fire. Uh, two, uh, two of the men that were hit, there was a medic there that I was replacing. He was working on one of the, one of the wounded guys, I was working on the other wounded guy. Uh, he had chest, uh, second chest wound and his jaw was all uh, uh, torn apart and he was not breathing. So the cricothyroidectomy, it was boom, right, the first week. So uh, that was kind of cool. And then we put the, I put, when, as we were putting, it called in a dust off, uh, about five or 10 minutes, that dust off was there, put my, uh, my soldier on board. And the other medic put his soldier on board. He jumped onto the dust off and he said, I'm out of here. I've got two weeks left in country, see you later. So here I was with the, my new platoon. Uh, they, were, they knew that at least they accepted me that I was repairing and, and fixing uh, the patient that I had, the soldier that I had. And then when they found out I was specially uh, forces trained, they were very impressed. And, and so then they, they accepted me into the, uh, into the platoon. Um, here's a little, few uh, statistics uh, about, about the choppers and the dust offs in Vietnam. Uh, 18,000, 5,000, well, you can read it all there. Pilots lost, crewmen lost, the hours, absolutely incredible. Booby traps in our area were, was probably the biggest uh, problem that we had. There were some sweeps, the NBA would come by every once in a while, or we had snipers, or, uh, but the booby traps were, was the worst. Uh, our point man uh, was a very good point man, and he would find most of them. Of course, he couldn't find all of them, and if, we, uh, if he couldn't find them, then we would get hit, or other, other platoons would get hit. Here is Big O, uh, his, here is our point man, and he was alive until he until he left Vietnam, so he was a good boy man. <laughs> um, I, my size and my, uh, because I was a small, one of the small ones, uh, we had, uh, and we had, we ran into booby traps and caves and caches, I became the tunnel rat. Uh, I, I, I didn't mind being the tunnel rat, actually I liked it. And this is, here's a tunnel that has a few uh, booby traps in it, and you can barely see the, the fish line there. Uh, there is a uh, uh, there's a detonator down there, and of course this is a pit with a uh, punji sticks a pit. Uh, they had here's a cave entrance up here up on the top. You can see the top uh, where you don't see any entrance, and then here is the Kit Carson Scout peeking out of the cave. 
Uh, here's some examples of booby traps, uh, the punji sticks stepping in the, in the holes or the rice paddies. There was all kinds of booby traps. And uh, the, the VC, they didn't care about killing us. All they needed to do was maim or injure somebody and, and get them out of there. So that's why the booby traps were here. Um, most of the rune, mo most of my wounds, like I say, were uh, from shrapnel or uh, AK-47 rounds. And the most common, uh, common thing we would have to do was stop the bleeding. Um, and so we had those pressure dressings. The pressure dressings all had ties on them. They were different sizes. And then you, could, uh, you can see here they're putting a pressure dressing on the neck and they're putting IVs. So I started a lot of IVs myself. And then, of course, uh, splinting or, or, or anything like that or any minor surgeries that we might have to do. Um, the dust-offs would get there quick. Uh, we, we'd call in a dust-off. We were, had to be in communication uh, with the pilots and the crewmen. Uh, most all the air ambulances had uh, a medic on it, so we, we could uh, inform them of, of, the, uh, of the condition of the, of the patient. Um, here, here's somebody, here's a dust-off floating up. And here we get these uh, Flying ambulances named Dust Off from the call sign of the original Army uh, medevac crew in Vietnam. Uh, I don't know if you can read all, have time to read all of this, but basically it was just uh, seeing the tremendous amount of uh, life saving uh, dust offs that we had. Wounded, uh, dust off, 93% survived from the dust offs. Uh, and with the, you know, the medic, we, we medics, we, we counted on these dust offs. It was incredible. And, it was, and knowing that they were, down here it says that they, they came over an, an average of 100 minutes. I never had to wait that long. I never had to wait more than 30, and I don't, it was probably 20. Those dust offs were there when we called them. It was incredible. Um, I'd like to tell you about one of the closest. Uh, Closest, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, happenings to me, or issues to me. When we were, had, we had a, a trail. We were walking on a, a rice rice paddy dike here, and uh, this, I guess, is the scariest moment for me. And a, a BC popped up out of the rice paddy, maybe only ten feet away. Uh, and he took his AK-47 and he sprayed it right like that in front of me. The, the soldier in front of me got hit, the soldier in back of me got hit, I did not get hit. Everyone shot at this uh, VC as he ran through the rice paddy into the jungle, he didn't get hit. I went and treated the gentleman in front of me, he had got hit in the uh, stomach and the thigh, started an IV, called in the dust off, went to the guy behind me, uh, he was shot in the elbow and the knee, uh, started an IV on him, uh, stopped the bleeding, uh, and then the dust off got there and took them off. I could not believe that I did not get hit at point blank range. He hit me and, or, I mean, he, he missed me and we missed him. Uh, but that was the closest that I, I was in many firefights and ambushes, but that was really the, the closest one to, uh, to me getting hit. We also had a, uh, a time where we had a sniper uh, near, in a church down near our, uh, our position, our platoon's position. We were up on a hill and he would fire in a few rounds every night at us and we'd shoot a couple of rounds back at him, but we never got him. I remember one evening, it was, it was late at night, I was walking by the medical hooch, all our hooches were sandbags and everything, and a bullet, I literally heard a bullet whoosh by me and smack right into a, a sandbag next to my head. And I started laughing. I, what I got in my mind, a visual in my mind, was a cartoon with the bubbles where it says whoosh or pow or sack or thud and that's exactly what my mind saw and felt at that time. Whoosh, thud, boom, and I started laughing. And I guess they say, what do they say? 
You'd never hear the one coming at you, right? So I was lucky I didn't hear it. Or when I was lucky I heard it. Um, when we'd go on, uh, we, another uh, uh, thing that we would do there in the Army, uh, now that they were uh, downsizing and instead of search and destroy, uh, we were now uh, with smaller companies and smaller units and uh, compared to the larger units earlier on in search and destroy, now we were search and hold and pacification. So we, a lot of times we would go to the villages and do uh, med caps and treat all the people and everything. When I'd go to the, uh, into the villages, I used to uh, drink their water and eat their food. I know I shouldn't have, but I, but I did. Um, late in December, I got violently ill and I was sent to the uh, 64th Evac ho Hospital in Quignon and they did a blood test and came out a positive VDRL, which meant I had syphilis. I said, wait a minute, I, there's no way I could have syphilis. I haven't seen, I've been in the boonies for months. I haven't seen any good looking villagers or anything. Uh, there's no way I have that. They did, they explored uh, diseases are, are caused by cells that have different shapes, round or square or rods or clumps. And there's, apparently there's two disease, there's only two diseases that have a spiral, spirochete. And syphilis is one of them. So whenever we would do our VDRL positive tests, the soldiers would have syphilis. However, the other disease was called Sushu Gamushi fever. And it came from uh, rat feces or, or bad water, which I had been partaking in. So they found out that I had uh, this uh, Sushu Gamushi fever instead of syphilis. So they cured me and sent me on back, into, back to my unit. <laughs> Um, the bull story. Here's another uh, interesting story along with my, my yearly stay in Vietnam. There was a correspondent who came out to our platoon. Uh, he had found out uh, through, some, through, some, through channels that I had uh, performed a, a surgery on a water buffalo. And he wrote this article about me. Uh, Wally has treated all kinds of Vietnam people from fevered mama son to the wounded enemy uh, prisoner. He may have uh, found his patient while in MedCap or many while in patrol. Many times an English-speaking Vietnamese boy will call for his help or a grief-stricken Vietnamese mom will cry for Boxi, Boxi Doc. Unusual to most uh, medics, the villagers called upon Doc to care for their sick or wounded animals. Ziegler recalled one time, um, once a, a Brahma bull charged at our point man, big O, in our patrol, and the point man uh, panicked and shot the bull in the leg. The bull was the only means for plowing the fields and the concerned owner had, and remembering his father's technique, Doc extracted the round, brought the beast of burden back to a useful condition. Uh, the water buffalo was very, very important to the villagers. Um, here you can see a, a, a Arvin, a, a South Vietnamese a troop, uh, looking for mines, and they're walking their uh, water buffaloes out to the field to do the work. Uh, they were handled by the kids even. Um, actually, most, uh, in almost all the villages, you'd only see kids from age 12 and under and uh, old men from 70 and over. They're, all, the other guy, all the other 12 to 70 year olds were VC. <laughs> and so then was Getting out of Vietnam on the Freedom Bird, going back to the world. Um, I had completed all my uh, tour and got on my Freedom Bird and went back to um, see, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. Landed in Fort Lewis, Washington on September 30th. And then the next morning, October 1st, uh, my cousin who lived in Seattle, she came to pick me up. And so I left the Army base and got out of the Army and Vietnam at the same time. And that was the last time I was in an army base. Um, I wanted to show you just a, 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 as a coincidence, uh, because of uh, my, my mind, I was never officially a, a CO, but in my mind I was a conscious objector and I never carried a weapon in Vietnam. Um, this is a commemorative stone for uh, conscious objectors and it happened to be dedicated uh, in 1994 on May 15th, which is my birthday. May 15th, not 1994, but well, I guess it was in 1994 too. 
And this is the monument to all those who have established and maintaining the right to refuse to kill. Uh, here's a monument for combat medics. And uh, this is at Fort Sam Houston. It's got the, uh, the, dust off, the, the dust off Huey up there and the medic uh, treating, the, uh, treating the, the wounded. Uh, there's also a uh, World War II uh, combat medical memorial at Sam, Fort Sam Houston as well. Uh, my RTO, uh, Mooch. Oh, here's the, here's the combat medical badge. Uh, the, and when I got that going to the combat zone in Vietnam, uh, Special Forces combat medics don't wear this badge anymore. They only wear the CIB, the combat infantry badge. Uh, here is my uh, RTO, Mooch. Uh, about uh, three years ago, uh, he called me up. He said, Doc, we, uh, 73rd is having a reunion down in San Diego. Can you make it? Uh, he lives in Florida. And I said, sure, I'll do it. So here I, I ended up uh, uh, meeting my friend Mooch. And that's it. I, 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 I did want to say one other thing. Uh, to me, you chopper pilots, you helicopter pilots, are the best damn thing that ever happened to me and all the wounded people in Vietnam or any of the wars. They, you, you helicopter pilots, you were there for protection, you were there for dust-offs, you enabled the medics to save lives, you were there for food and supplies, you were there for transportation, you were there for combat assaults, uh, you brought barbers out to our platoon. I'd learned from Mooch when they were coming, so I'd leave. And donut dollies. Uh, I had three Met, New York Mets won the World Series in October 1969. When I first got there, I listened to the World Series. Then in, uh, I think it was March or April, three of the New York Mets were choppered out into my platoon. Ron Swoboda, Jim Mudcat Grant, and Mil Papas. So, and the chopper pilots made that happen. You guys, I respect every damn one of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, uh, Wally, would you be willing to tell them how many American lives you've saved while you're in Vietnam? Uh, well, I, fig I know David and I have been talking about this. It, it was more than a dozen, and I only lost, and that's that I, what I know, there's only two men that I lost that were alive when I got to them the whole year. But, uh, I, but it was more than a dozen that I, that I did save live, and me, even more that just patched up and sent, sent away. Yes, yes sir. Yes sir. My brother and uh, his best friend, <laughs> combat medics. His best friend was a SEAL, but uh, they used KIA in 68. Yeah. Uh, outside Long Bay. Uh, was all COs exempt? Or no, no, no. There was non-service COs and service COs. Uh, there were a lot of uh, COs that we, we didn't care. We wanted to go to war. Uh, and uh, like I say, uh, there were other uh, COs that just had that just stayed stateside, correct? Yes, sir. I know that it took less than an hour from the time you called for a dust off to come and pick up that guy and get him to a hospital in combat conditions. What I'd like to know after that, have you ever met any of these individuals that you saved their lives since you've come home? Ah, that, that's a good, he wanted to know if I ever met anyone that I had uh, dusted off. Uh, yes, I have, I, I met two of them. Uh, one gentleman uh, was, he was going, uh, we had, uh, what, do you call, what do you call those, uh, Claymore, we had Claymores around our perimeter and we would set those up every night and then in the morning we picked them up. He went to uh, pick uh, his Claymore up in the morning and it went off. So it got all, his entire leg was blown, uh, I was making hot chocolate up in there, I ran down to the, uh, down to him and then I told Mooch to call in a dust off. Uh, we, uh, I actually splinted his leg with two Playboy magazines, and then and then he went off. Uh, he was from Iowa. Uh, Facebook. Uh, one time during Facebook, he had uh, he had uh, 
contacted me through that, asked if I was doc, the doc that was, uh, was in his patro uh, platoon, uh, Hoagie, Steve Hoag, and, uh, and it was. So I, I, got, I got in contact with him. And also the other, the other one was, was Mooch. Uh, remember when that uh, that VC guy swept uh, swept at us? He Mooch was behind me. He was the one that got hit in the knee and the shoulder, and so and then I also uh, got together with him after after as well. He got in touch with me, and we've been in touch ever, ever since Vietnam. And then that's when he got me uh, together with him in that reunion. Yes, sir. How many men were in the training to become? Doctors, or oh, uh, and did they all graduate? Uh, no, they, we, we had a, good, a big attrition rate. I think maybe 30 of us started, uh, and it was a year year program. By the by, the time the end, when you go to the second survival, uh, there was probably only uh, 20 of us left. Uh, then there was. They told us that the first, the top five would go to, to the Berlin Brigade. The Special Forces had a Berlin Brigade, just guard duty in Europe. And uh, so, but then when they put up the list, the top five of us uh, got to Vietnam. Uh, so there was probably, <laughs> there was probably only about uh, uh, 15 of us left. Yeah, right. right. That sounds like the Army, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. What did you do as a civilian when you got out? Uh, actually, as a civilian, I went to a, a medical school and I became a doctor, became a psychiatrist, and I've been, uh, I had a lot of patients up until then, and about uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I retired from medicine and went back to my love of the theater. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. What a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Well, I also want to mention the speaker, Jerome, or the trainers. <laughs>